Welcome to New Year, New Tech Plan, Mission Driven Technology Planning. My name is Becky Wiegand and I am the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup Global. And I am in sunny San Francisco today and happy to be your host for this webinar. I am joined today by two of my esteemed colleagues from TechSoup Canada, our partner in Toronto that runs a program throughout Canada. And they really are um, you know, super to work with and I love having them as colleagues to be able to call on to share their expertise with our audience. Uh, whether you are in the U.S. or Canada or someplace else joining us from around the world, uh, their expertise uh, is universal I think. So I'm really glad to have them. The first of our presenters will be Tierney. She is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of TechSoup Con Canada, and her goal is to build technology capacity in the nonprofit sector. She regularly blogs and speaks at nonprofit webinars and conferences. She also has experience developing software in the corporate sector and has a degree in software engineering from the University of Waterloo. So we're glad to have her joining us. Also joining today is Joyce Sue, who oversees TechSoup's Canada's external communications. So that includes running email campaigns, blogs, social media, and events. So she has a ton of experience doing the hands-on work of getting your message out and helping plan how to best do that, picking the tools and things like that. So she has experience in the charitable sector and understands what it means to wear multiple hats having been an event planner, program developer, and fundraiser herself. She has a deep love for the world of philanthropy and seeks to help the nonprofit sector be more efficient and effective with technology. So again, a great uh, talent to have joining us today. And again, my name is Becky and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here. And I've been with TechSoup Global for coming on seven years. Prior to that, spent a decade working at small nonprofits wearing a variety of hats uh, in four different nonprofits in Washington, D.C., and then later in Oakland, California where I live. So I am very pleased to be your host today. You will also see assisting with chat Ali Bazdikian who is an interactive events and video producer here at TechSoup. She will be there to answer your questions and help you with any technical issues throughout the webinar. I mentioned that we at TechSoup Global are here in our headquarters in San Francisco, and that Tierney and Joyce are in Toronto. But go ahead and chat into us to let us know where you are so we can have an idea of where you are all joining from today. We know you can't see the chat messages coming in. You can just see what we put out to you. But if there are tips or resources or advice, experiences that you share that we think are useful for the rest of our audience to know, we'll go ahead and chat those back out. We have people joining from all over the U.S., Colorado, Massachusetts, Ohio, Indiana, California, Oregon, Missouri, San Diego, uh, that's a city, not a state, Florida, Virginia, all over. So we're really glad to have you all with us today. I have some people rooting for their favorite teams. Go Hawks. Is that the Seahawks? I don't know my sports. Sorry. Um, so thanks so much for being with us. And a quick look at our agenda. I'll do an introduction to TechSoup and what we do. Then we'll have an opportunity to hear from you around your technology planning and what's important to you. Then we'll go ahead and launch into how to access your current technology use, look at some case studies, and here are some tips on technology planning and how to use it best. So TechSoup Global is a network of 63 partner NGOs around the world serving nonprofits, libraries, and social benefit organizations in 121 countries. We work to connect and get technology in the hands of you, the people who are serving your communities and doing great work and social good around the world. You can see where we are around the world, many places. So if you are joining from someplace outside of the U.S., uh, you may want to go to TechSoupGlobal.org to find if you have a local, local partner in your country that can serve you with technology donations and resources as well. You can see a bit about our impact that we have saved the technology or the, the NGO sector more than $4.8 billion in technology products and grants. So I'm proud to have been both a TechSoup user when I was in those small nonprofits and also a TechSoup staff person now. And you can find out more about our product donation programs at TechSoup.org. Or again, if you are joining from outside the U.S. to check one of those countries uh, to see if there's a program where you live. Now on to the topic of the day. Do you have a tech plan at your organization? Go ahead and answer honestly, not aspirationally. <laughs> honestly, do you have one and is it solid 
or maybe you have one sort of informally, maybe you don't at all, or you might have something else to say about it. So go ahead and chat in the comments if there's something else you'd like to share. I'll let everybody have an opportunity to, take, uh, to respond here by clicking one of those radio buttons. So hopefully we can get some information. We have lots of people chatting in, no's, 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 I wish. Yes, informally. We're working to make it serious. <laughs> Emily comments in the chat that it only comes out at certain times. That there, and then Catherine comments, we're working to put our first tech plan together. And some people have started but not yet flushed them out. We have one, but no one outside the tech department knows about it. Oh, we know that's a problem, isn't it? Well, I'm going to go ahead and show the results on screen. We have about 85 people in here right now. And it looks like almost half of you have no tech plan, and about 45%, slightly less, have um, yes informally. So it looks like a, about 50-50 split on whether you have some kind of tech plan or you have none at all. So uh, Dean comments, uh, we have no tech department, which I'm sure is a very common issue. And, and all the nonprofits I worked for had no tech department either. That was uh, me always. <laughs> so one other question for you here. Why is technology important for your nonprofit? And go ahead and check all that apply to your organization. And if there's some other reason, go ahead and chat us in, uh, comment to us in the chat. Does technology, is it important because it provides your access to Internet and email? Does it increase your efficiency of operations? Does it help you track your organization's impact? Engage supporters or patrons? We know some of you may be joining us from public libraries, so maybe it helps you with that. And we didn't put a whole lot on here that was specific to different types of organizations out there. So if you have a specific way that it's really important to you, go ahead and chat us in. Does it help provide flexibility or mobility, allowing you to work remotely or connect with your teams that might be in the field or located in different places? Does it help you increase your donations? Is it a service you offer to your community? So maybe you provide technology to your community in the form of library patrons or senior centers or whatever it may be. Go ahead and let us know. We have some people commenting in the chat that it uh, provides client database for services we provide. Um, Emily comments that they're a public library. It's essential for patrons. Uh, let's see, who else? M Michael comments it gets our message and information out as a church and religious organization beyond the walls. Lots of good answers here. And this is a multiple choice, multiple answers. So you can click as many as you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results in just a couple of seconds here. Veronica comments that they use it for collaboration. They have board members in the U.S., Europe, and South America. Um, Linda comments, we include, include our program in the community. We are a well-kept secret now. <laughs> yeah, that can be a challenge, can't it? So I'm going to show the results really quickly. You can feel free to keep chatting into us. We are reading those messages. So it looks like 97% really see that technology is important because it increases the efficiency of your operations. That's a, a huge portion of you have voted for that one. And providing Internet and email access which is you know, the staple of how most of us communicate on a day-to-day -day basis. We also have engaging supporters and patrons as big ones. So this is great. Thank you for taking the time um, to share that. We do have somebody asking if there's a way that participants can see all the comments, and we don't actually have a way to open it up to everyone. It's a limitation of the tool we're using. So like I said, if there are comments that we think are useful, we'll share them back out in the chat with you. I won't be reading them out any longer. So. Thank you so much. With that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first presenter, Tierney Smith from TechSoup Canada. And she'll be talking to us about New Year, New Tech Plan, Mission Driven Technology Planning. Welcome to the program, Tierney. We're so glad to have you. Thanks so much, Becky. Uh, you can hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, Becky did a great introduction, so thank you so much for that. We're super glad to be here today. Um, so you've already heard a little bit about uh, TechSoup from Becky. 
So essentially, uh, who we are as TechSoup Canada is we are the Canadian partner in that global network of TechSoups around the world. So our focus is, uh, for those of you in Canada, uh, hopefully you're familiar with us, our focus is on helping you guys in particular to use technology, whether that's getting you uh, the discounts and donations through the Technology Donations Program or whether it's by providing educational opportunities like this. But really we love all nonprofits and libraries everywhere, so we're really happy to be here today. Um, a little bit uh, more about uh, some of those other educational things that we do because they are much more cross-border. Some ways that you can find us are on our blog, on social media, and we do host regular monthly events that we live stream publicly to anyone who wants to join. So those are just a few ways if you, know, you think you're listening to us, you think we're so cool, you really want to stay in touch, which is a logical response uh, to today's webinar, then I highly recommend you check us out and we'd love to hear from you on some of those channels. Another thing to know about us is that we are a small nonprofit ourselves. So there's uh, about eight of us in the TechSoup Canada team. So we know what it's like to be a small nonprofit. And we're actually a program of the Center for Social Innovation, which is a nonprofit based out of Toronto and New York. And we are a co working space, uh, community, and launch pad for people who are trying to change the world, whether you're a nonprofit, social purpose business, uh, social enterprise, etc. So if you're in one of those cities, I also definitely recommend you check out the Center for Social Innovation. So to start off today's presentation, we wanted to have some really broad framing about why is technology important. And we did the little poll earlier, and I think that really highlighted that a lot of you guys are coming into this webinar with a really good understanding of the roles that technology can play in an organization, which I think is fantastic. So I love that all of you, as almost every single person that answered the poll talked about the role of technology in increasing efficiency of your organization. And I'm really glad that you guys have a good understanding of that. That is really encouraging because that is certainly the starting point for seeing the role that if you, you, know, if you can use technology to do the things you want to do with a greater efficiency, then of course that gives you more time for your mission. As well, you guys all pointed out a lot of uh, other excellent reasons why technology can be really important for a nonprofit, even though that might not be your primary focus. So we have a way we like to think about technology at TechSoup Canada and to put it in the context of your larger organization. So that, the way is to think about your organization a little bit like a house. So the roof of your organization is your mission. So this is the thing that at the end of the day you are formed to do. This is your primary role in life basically. If you're not fulfilling your mission, then you're not doing your job as a nonprofit. So uh, that's really the goal at the end of the day. So we put that at the top of the chart because everything basically supports that. Everything else you do is supporting that mission and holding it up. So the walls of your house are your programs and services. So those are the things that you do in order to achieve your mission because they fit with your theory of change because um, that's what you think is going to create the change that you want to see. So whether that is to provide access to patrons at your public library or whether that is to uh, run church services or whether that's to provide a homeless shelter or whatnot, those are your programs and services that are supporting your mission. Pretty straightforward so far. You know this all better than me. Now, what you have in basically the foundation of your house, there's a whole bunch of different layers and pieces to that to support your programs and services. So finances and fundraising or grant seeking are a couple examples of some of the things that you need to do just to keep things running. So we've put technology there as the bottom foundation of your house. And we find this is a really helpful way to think about things because if you think about technology um, simply as maybe like a way to keep the lights on, it's just a frustration you need to deal with, then it might not be given the proper importance in your organization. And it might be hard for other people in your organization, if you're the accidental techie, you know, you're trying to convince someone else to understand why this is something we should be having a conversation about, why we should we be spending money on, etc. But if you see technology as the foundation for your entire house, then it, puts it helps put it in that place. Because if you don't have a strong foundation, then if your foundation, you know, maybe it's fine for a while, but eventually uh, your whole house is going to come tumbling down. And that could be because, you know, whether it's a backup problem or whether, you know, it's your, uh, your database is just so difficult to use, it's not meeting your needs at all, or whether it's you have some very public um, social media fail or whatever happens. Um, basically, if you don't have those solid plans at every level, you can end up, it's kind of like a game of Jenga 
um, where you, know, you eventually are cutting costs and cutting costs and cutting costs, and eventually the whole thing comes crumbling down. So today we're going to talk about how to turn that on its head and instead help you build a strong foundation that will support your programs and services and ultimately support your mission, because that's what it's all about. So um, today what we're going to talk about, most of our presentation is going to be spent going through a framework that we've developed at TechSoup Canada that we suggest is a helpful way to think about what is technology in a nonprofit. And I saw someone commented that in. It's a great question. What does, what does it really mean to say that we talk about technology? It's such a big concept, it can be kind of overwhelming to think about. So what we like to do is break down what does technology really mean? Well, we look at it as being a whole bunch of different things. Um, we use infrastructure, your back office, your data, your communications, your technology that supports your programs, and then how your technology ties into your overall strategy. So what we're going to do from here on is we're going to look at each one of these areas and talk a little bit about what are some technologies in this area, share a case study or an example of a nonprofit that's doing some cool work in this area to hopefully give you some ideas. So, um, just a little framework of, so that's what we're going to go through today, how you can use this in your organization. What I'm going to recommend that you do after this session is that you go back to your organization and you assess what is currently going on in your organization if you haven't already done so. We actually have a template that I'll show you in a second to help you do just that. Then once you've done that assessment, um, there's a few kind of key things that you can do, even if you're a small organization or an accidental techie that doesn't have a full tech department. Of course, if you have a good tech department, great, this will be a lot easier to do. The first thing we always recommend you do is check for any obvious cost savings. So by that I mean maybe you're paying for more than one website for hosting and you aren't actually using one anymore. Or maybe you know, you're buying someone a really expensive computer that you don't need to. Sometimes there's just some little things that just taking an audit of everything can help identify and bring up. Um, the next step is just to look for a few short-term goals. You can get kind of your quick wins you can easily fix to help start getting people excited about this tech stuff. And then um, try to pick yourself maybe one goal for the year, for the next year and a half, that you can, a larger piece you can start working towards. Maybe your website needs to be redone, maybe your database, etc. So, and of course, document things. That's your tech plan. So I just want to share this as a high-level framework, but this will make a lot more sense once we've gone through all of the pieces of the tech plan. I just want to say a couple of other framing things at this point in the presentation. We talked in the, uh, in the description of the session about how technology can, uh, smart technology spending can save you money. And what we're, gonna, we're not necessarily going to tell you in this presentation how to cut costs per se, your organization, but the philosophy that we're going to be recommending is that by being planful about your technology and uh, getting buy-in and being intentional, like asking good questions up front, that is how you save money with technology. Um, you, by not spending on random things that aren't important or that aren't really going to be used, um, and by making smart investments that will save your staff time, that is how you're going to save money and increase your impact. So we're going to keep coming back to the theme throughout, the, 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 uh, throughout, the, sorry, throughout today's webinar. The other sort of overall theme I wanted to share is that um, tech planning in some ways is common sense. It's about planning and just taking the time to think things through. I don't want anyone to go away from this session with the idea that tech planning is such a big and difficult thing that they can't even get started and they don't know how to do it. I don't like to make technology intimidating. I don't think that's really helpful for anyone. So what I want you to remember, if, if nothing else, is just that um, taking time up front to ask some good questions and to really think intentionally about how you're using technology is technology planning. If you can really articulate that, link it to your strategy, and create a great document, that is awesome too, and you should definitely aspire for that. Um, but it's better to start with asking a few good questions, if nothing else. And I did promise you that there would be um, an actual assessment to help you do all of this and take it away with your organization. So we have a link here, and we'll be sharing it after the uh, session as well. We do have a template for tech self-assessment online that will go through all the areas we're going to talk about today and help you apply this to your own organization. So this can be a session that will really help you out going forward. Now, without further ado, I am going to jump into the actual different aspects of the framework that I presented just a minute ago. So I'm going to talk about a couple of them, then I'll pass it over to Joyce, and then we'll be back to me so we can mix it up a little bit. 
So let's start by talking about laying the groundwork with good infrastructure. Now, what is it we mean by infrastructure? This is essentially uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of your technology in your organization. And this is often what people think about when they think about technology because some of it is very visible, right? Do you have a computer? Does it work quickly enough to let you do the things that you want to do? Can you actually load up your internet browser or load up your database? Or do you have to go away and get a very long coffee uh, while that happens? Do you have a good internet and network connection that is fast enough again for you to do your work? Do you have good backups of your systems? Do you have good security in place? Do you have tech policies and practices that um, support your organization? Now, you might be, if, if any of you are interested in learning more about these topics, we have a lot of resources on our website, and TechSoup.org does as well. So I'm not going to go into detail on each one of them because the amount of time we have today. And I think as well, a lot of you may be familiar with a lot of these topics and know um, some of the advice on how, to, uh, on how to address them. I think with this area of infrastructure, often the, uh, the issue is more just getting it done. We kind of put some of these things off because uh, we other things uh, become a higher priority it gets kind of pushed down the scale. So the image that I want, to, I want you to think about here is this idea that it doesn't matter if your house is well kept when your basement is flooded. So often it can be tempting to put our time into sexier projects like getting a new database. Well, I find that sexy. Maybe you don't. Um, or getting a new website or getting on the latest social media tool. But again, if your computer doesn't run quickly enough to do that, or if you put together all this data in a database and then uh, you actually lose all the data because you don't have a backup of your server, then it's not really going to help you go forward. And I do, you know, there are obviously a lot of uh, horror stories to be shared. I think you've, you may have heard some of them. Um, one painful one that uh, happened to a, f a nonprofit, it's a friend of mine recently was that I was helping them out and uh, they had a couple of servers. Their tech guy had just left and they weren't sure uh, whether those servers were backed up enough and we were in the process of trying to figure that out and trying to get them an interim solution. And the day before we put it in place, one of their servers died and it turns out they did not have a backup. So it's that kind of thing. It doesn't happen every day, but it does happen often enough and I don't want any of you to be in that situation. So a good place to start with this, and again, especially when it comes to getting buy-in from your leadership, because I know that can be difficult, is to take an inventory of your technology. Sometimes just laying it all out there is helpful and it provides people with the documentation they need to ha start having a conversation about actually having more modern technology and getting those upgrades in place. So we do have some templates for you online which you can use to help out with that process. Um, also, just using some of the resources will help you know, okay, you know, if your computer hasn't been upgraded in the last five years, that is uh, sort of a basic standard that might help you think, okay, well, we don't need to be on the latest industry standard, but once it's past five years, is it really working and doing what we need? Uh, maybe we need to consider upgrading. So that's all I'll say about infrastructure, but just to, um, to leave that there, that, it, that is really, if, if technology is the foundation of your nonprofit house, infrastructure is the foundation of your technology. So definitely make sure that you have a solid foundation there. The second area that I'm going to talk to you about today is about organizing your back office. And uh, this is kind of a broad term that it's not necessarily clear, so let me talk to you a little bit about what I mean for that. Back office is a term that we use to describe a whole bunch of the different types of technologies that you use to just run the administrative side of your nonprofit. So most fundamentally, email, right? Most nonprofits today, I hope every single nonprofit here, and a lot of you mentioned this at the beginning, just has access to Internet and email. That's it's kind of a basic functionality that you need to work in today's world. Uh, and other points include file storage, right? Obviously you have files, where do you put them? Is it in a central place that is accessible to everyone in the organization? Is it backed up? And this also reaches into other areas such as, do you have a project management tool you use? Where do you track your finances? How do you uh, do your calendars and scheduling meetings internally and externally? And how do you work on documents collaboratively as a team? 
I will say that uh, for 2015 and uh, just for the past few years really, the biggest trend we've been noticing in this area is the move to cloud. And in particular, uh, not only just cloud solutions, but in integrated cloud solutions that will actually cover a lot of your back office needs together. So the most common ones you've probably heard of are Google Apps for nonprofits and Office 365 for nonprofits. If you haven't heard of them, essentially what both of them are is back office cloud suites. So they will take functionality that everybody needs to have like email, file storage, calendars, events, etc., and they'll bundle it into one tool that's all integrated together. So they're both excellent tools. One's from Google, one's from Microsoft. They're both free for most nonprofits. Uh, so those are worth looking into if you are struggling with an aging email server or um, having other challenges like that. Another trend we're seeing in this area is uh, the idea of hybrid cloud. So if you're not familiar with that, what that's about is some nonprofits are saying, well, I like the idea of cloud computing because it, uh, you know, it provides us with a lot of flexibility. It can be more cost effective. We can access our stuff from anywhere. It is more backed up and it can be more secure in some ways. But we have certainty that we would really rather keep in-house on a database. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some of our applications in the cloud and we're going to keep some of our applications in the server and we're going to be strategic about what we do where. We don't have to go all one or all the other. So again, we have more hybrid information about hybrid cloud available, but that's something to consider if, you're, if that resonates with your situation. So an example that I'll share uh, in this area is a, a nonprofit in Canada called Brampton Caledon Community Living. And what they do is they support individuals with uh, developmental delays throughout their lives and uh, just in helping them to have a place to live and uh, have their needs looked after in a respectful and uh, supportive way. So one of the challenges that they were having, and maybe some of you will resonate with this, is that they had 43 different houses, so they're a little bit bigger, um, and they were all running off of one slow email server. So it was basically all the IT person could do. They did have one IT person. It was all he could do to really just keep that email server running and keep the emails being delivered to where they were supposed to go because it was constantly having problems. Uh, they also had a challenge with their documents because they were so dispersed. They didn't have a good central location for documents. Everything was getting emailed out. And, so, uh, and these were really important documents such as information on the, each client's care. Sometimes the wrong version would get to the wrong people or people you know, in an emergency wouldn't know where to go to find the latest information. So because of these challenges, Brampton Calvin Community Living decided to go with Office 365, which is the tool that I mentioned just a minute ago. And they decided to focus first on their email situation, which was the most critical for them, and probably will be the most critical for a lot of you. So they decided, should we replace our server? No, we're going to move to the cloud, um, and we're comfortable with that level of security. So they moved their email to the uh, email portion of Office 365 for nonprofits, which is really nice because it lets people either use the cloud version if they want or still use Outlook on their computers if they prefer. So it's a nice way to transition without making it too rushed for people that aren't ready to do everything in the cloud right away, which is totally okay. Once they had that email piece in place, they also looked at what other improvements they could do. And uh, one of them, as, as I mentioned, documents was a problem in central document storage. So they decided to use OneDrive, which is the tool that comes with Office 365, that's especially for files. Now, if any of you guys have used Dropbox, it's kind of a similar idea. Um, but the thing, so other than OneDrive, other than being Microsoft's product, um, because it's associated with this uh, organization-wide system, it means that everyone in the organization can get access to the files in OneDrive, of course, based on appropriate permission structures. So by putting the files in there, they made sure everyone could uh, access the files that they needed at any point and always have the right version. And they actually went a little bit further to get some of their staff, their key staff tablets so that they could access those data wherever they were, um, especially in case of an emergency which did sometimes come up in their type of nonprofit work. So one, uh, one tip you can take away from this, aside from the, even just the idea of moving to the cloud, uh, just for any IT project is to plan and implement in phases. So if you're struggling to get, especially again, if you're struggling to get buy-in for a project, with many of us are, if you're struggling to get funding, sometimes it's easier to sell people on doing the first phase of something 
uh, instead of doing the entire project. And also that can be a better way to transition your staff if they're resistant to change when it comes to technology. So maybe if we just move our email, everyone can kind of get used to the system before we make another change. So it's always something to consider. If I'm struggling to get, um, push this project forward, how can I break it down into phases? So that's a little bit about back office. Um, now we're going to talk about data management, uh, which is a really important topic as well. And I'm going to pass you over to Joyce at this point, and you're going to hear a bit from her. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it's Joyce from Texas, Canada. So I'm going to take um, the presentation. Uh, we'll keep it going. Uh, so right now on this aspect of data management, which seems like such an obvious uh, statement that technology is one of the forefront, if not the foundation of this. Um, but one of the uh, things that we really want to stress with this is not necessarily the data collection, which if you're not collecting data at your nonprofit, we highly encourage you to do so. Um, whether you're aware of it or not, whether you're small, whether you're large, you are collecting data. Whether you have uh, volunteers, donors, financial data, your HR policies, staff data, um, just even program outcomes, how do you measure the success and failures of your initiatives, these are all data points. Um, and the, the concept that we're trying to emphasize is not so much that you need to collect them, because you are collecting them whether you're aware of it or not, but do so in a meaningful way and in a way that will help you um, find them when you need to uh, make a decision or make a strategic um, a plan for your organization. So as you can see here, the visuals that I'm trying to give you is going back, if you don't have a plan and you're just collecting it, uh, your data, if you can imagine it as a tangible uh, piece that you can hold, um, it might be a piece of paper, it could be a file, a paper file on your desk, it would just be all over your office. Uh, so let's say you're, it's, you're um, executive director ask you, you know, how was our last workshop for high-risk youth? How many people came? Um, how were their feedback? Um, how much money did we actually spend from the grant? And basically want you to um, put together a progress report and also a funder report. Now those are two big crucial elements um, that are not completely tied to your mission, but it, it's crucial to ensure that your mission continues. Uh, so if you don't have a plan, you're in this image, you're, you're pretty much walking around trying to find all the different elements that are, uh, that are necessary to put together these reports. But as you can imagine, if you don't label them, if you don't know where they are, it will take a lot of time. Uh, so one of the case studies that we'll cover uh, later on has this problem. Uh, now the other aspect is now that you do label it, you know where everything is, um, but you're just piling it. You're not, you're not you're never looking at it, you're not analyzing it. Um, you, you are making strategic decisions, but you're not actually looking at your information to inform your decisions. So the second trend that we noticed is a lot of nonprofits are starting to collect data, um, but they're not uh, really thoughtfully analyzing it. So we also encourage you to have a technology plan for that. There are many different tools. It ranges from Excel, just using a simple pivot table, uh, to really dynamic data dashboards like Zoho reports um, or um, SAP tools like Crystal reports. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there that will help get the, uh, take the guesswork out of your current data and make it into something that you can just look at and get the necessary information from that. Uh, so I mentioned that there's a, a nonprofit in Canada. Oops, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, so the first case study is the Cam Cambridge Self-Help Food Bank. Uh, so for them, compiling these reports for their donors, for their board of directors, it used to take nearly a month because of all the manual work. Their staff have to uh, contact all the different departments. And at the end, they have to sift out all the relevant information um, and then compile it into a neat report that can be, cons can be digested easily. Um, so before having a tech strategy, that would take a long time. Um, time that could have been spent on actually delivering the program, which is the food bank, um, and ensuring that it's well stocked, that people are happy, and, and just getting more clients through. Uh, so then they took time to kind of take a step back and say, how do we um, empower our staff to actually achieve our mission more effectively? Uh, so in this case, they looked into constituent relationship management systems, which are usually called CRMs for short. And this particular system, they uh, settled on SUMAC, 
I shouldn't say settled. It's a great product for smaller uh, nonprofits and charities. Um, Sumac helps them uh, connect all of the data points and collect them um, automatically. So when they need to generate a report, they just need to tell the system what data sets they want to look at. Do they want to look at how many people um, received their services, how many people were satisfied with their services, and it just takes an hour to generate. And that that includes from beginning to end, so selecting that criteria and then generating the report. Uh, so that's one way that technology empowers them uh, to, uh, in terms of data management. Uh, the other aspect is um, just being able to uh, take all the data points and do easy analysis. Um, in this case, Maytree Foundation, they're able to, uh, again, with the same uh, tech planning in place, they have a CRM uh, that collects all of the information and, and is able to show them all the relevant information in one place. So it's easier for them to um, take a look at what's coming up, take a pulse of things. Um, so again, the trend is to not just collect your data, but really look at it and inform your decisions. Um, it will save you a lot of time and headache in the long run. When you do embark on a program and then it's not as successful as you think, uh, if you were to just take 10 or even an hour to look at the data uh, that you've been collecting, it can actually show you a lot of great trends. It, you can predict a lot of uh, things that you may not have been able to predict if you didn't look at it. Uh, so that is how information is a foundation for your data management and how this can in help and in inform your nonprofit. Uh, so the next area that uh, technology can help um, is in your communications. Uh, now this one seems, again, very straightforward. Of course, technology helps with our communications. You, you send emails. Uh, you know, we have this webinar. We're doing this all through the use of technology. Um, and even when you're doing your direct mail campaigns, you use technology to mail merge all the names together to have a gift matrix. We understand that you know that it's embedded, uh, but the trend is to not use technology as a tool, uh, to, like in a means to an end, uh, but use it as a foundation to guide your strategies. Again, being mindful of how you um, ta uh, partake in your activities and to resource your staff well. Uh, so these are some of the areas that technology, um, if you have it as a foundation, can really not only help you with your communications to your supporters and your donors and even your staff, um, but to really maximize that impact. Uh, so the first one, website. Now, of course, this seems, again, so easy. Of course, we need a website. That's how people find information about us. That's how they donate. Um, so you know, a way that technology serves as a foundation, again, it's not that it's a tool to make a website for you, but you have to really think about how, how do people view your website. So in this example, the trend is now responsive templates, responsive design. And we're not going to pretend that we're perfect in this area. If you ever check out TechSoupCanada.ca, you know that it's not responsive. We're working on it. We're in this together. We're all nonprofits. Um, but we also understand that the importance to plan your website in a strategic way. Uh, the reason why we keep stressing responsive and other Nonprofits and I'm sure uh, like nonprofit non consultants stress responsive design. Um, it's not just because it's sexy and modern and it looks great, but it's actually good for user experience. Uh, so user experience means from the person who's visiting your website, how do they experience your website? How do they use it? What do they read? How does your website look to them depending on the device that they use? So for example, let's say you have a fundraising campaign for disaster relief. It's so timely. It's so critical that you raised 50 grand in three months. Or even think of it as a crowdfunding campaign. You need to raise that amount in one month. These are timely fundraisers that you need to uh, gather a lot of attention to. So of course you're going to feature it on your website. So let's say you're at your computer, you know you have a website, you use technology to build it, it's great. Um, but then that, there's a big donation button that you know, draws a lot of attention. But if you didn't do uh, enough like tech foundation and, uh, and really think about how that website will display, let's say your donor views your website on a tablet. On a tablet, that big donation button is cut off. So when they look at it, they see all the main body content, but what they don't see is the big donation button because it's just cut off of their screen. If they looked at it on a desktop, they can see it, but because of the device that they use, they miss that very big call to action. So in that sense, you, you might not think of it as a big deal, but 
a lot of people are using mobile devices on their smartphone, on their iPads. Um, you don't want to miss a, a big call to action, a big communication point because you didn't plan it or foresee it ahead of time. Um, the same thing with social media. A lot of people are jumping in on so many different channels because they know that's where their audience is. Uh, the latest trend that we've been seeing, and we know that in the U.S., uh, like data privacy laws are uh, less strict than the Canadian privacy laws, but the trend is no matter which country you're in, no matter what platform you're in, uh, data um, and how you use it is becoming more strict. Uh, so with social media channels, it's great that you have great engagement on it. But in terms of how you can use that data, can you export that data out? What can you say on that platform? It would only get more strict from this point onwards. Um, so how does that affect your technology planning? When you plan for um, engagement tools like that's jump on Twitter, that's jump on Facebook or Tumblr or Vine, um, have a strategy as why you are there, what goals are you planning to achieve there. If it's just raising engagement and raising awareness, that's fine. Um, but if you want to tie it back to something more tangible, like I want to increase my funding, I want to increase brand recognition, uh, really think about how the data aspect ties into your social media. So um, as, as an example of this is, um, like for in Canada, when people are on social media networks, uh, it's great that you can connect with them there, um, but uh, as a data privacy law, we can't communicate with them outside of that channel. Again, that might not apply to the U.S. audience, but it's just almost the same comparison that the data is owned by those companies. You, you can't completely con have control over those aspects, so when you do want to make um, projects and initiatives with social media being kind of a backbone to them, you need to be strategic in that sense. Um, not, you know, raining down the social media parade is still great for exposure. Um, but again, keep that in mind. Um, and again, for emails and web conferencing, uh, it's not just about having the tool, but having a strategy in that tool. So kind of going back to the data aspect for emails, um, what kind of data are you collecting? Are they able, are your users able to subscribe, uh, sorry, uh, manage your subscriptions? Uh, so that's something that if you don't have a good technology plan, um, you might run into the trouble that when someone unsubscribes from you, they unsubscribe from everything. Everything from fundraising alerts to just uh, organization impact updates. These are things you don't want them to miss out on, so keep that in mind. Um, so on a, on a brighter case, because I, I know I talked a lot about data privacy and it's kind of a downer, so here's an uplifting case study of how when you have good technology planning and good foundation, you can really achieve your mission and again increase your impact. Uh, so the case study here is the Goodwill Industries International. Uh, for Labor Day, they decided to um, have this campaign where they share 150 success stories. So again, this is them um, reaching out to their supporters, um, and the goal was to raise awareness and celebrate their success, celebrate their impact, so then their donors and volunteers can be really proud that they're uh, supporting this great organization. Uh, so what they have is on Twitter, uh, they have a dedicated hashtag 150 jobs. Each day up to Labor Day, they would share one story per hour. Um, so in the second column, you see an example of what that looks like. And the third column is the community's response to them. So in this aspect, they were because they were planful, they know what their goals are, they weren't trying to raise money, they weren't trying to get more volunteers, they were just trying to highlight these success stories, um, make sure people are aware that they're, just not, they're not just a little thrift store, they actually do impact lives. Um, and in that aspect, they were a great success. So uh, again, I don't want to take up too much time. If, you're, if you want to learn more, um, the URL is there as an as a overview of that case study. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it back to Tierney, um, who will uh, continue with the tech planning. Thanks, Joyce. Um, so now we're going to talk about that top piece of the pyramid, which is what all of this stuff is really building towards, and that is how technology impacts running your programs and services. Now, for more than anything we've talked about so far, this is really going to be in affected by your individual organization, what your mission is, and what your specific programs are. So of course, the statements we're going to be making are fairly general, but I think that just more to take away the principles and see how they can apply to your organization. 
So when it comes to programming, what we really encourage you to do is to ask yourself across a whole bunch of range of areas, how can, te how can technology improve the way I administer my program? Just handle logistics. Maybe it's, uh, it's about using an online form to get program sign up instead of getting people to call in and writing it down on a piece of paper. Maybe that's something as easy as a free Google form that you're going to throw together. How can you use technology to change your program delivery? So the way TechSoup does webinars instead of uh, always having in-person events, or the way some counseling organizations are using social media and uh, text messaging to provide uh, support as an alternate channel to phone and email. Uh, how can technology be used to track your program data? So the stuff we talked about that Joyce talked about earlier in terms of data, specifically to uh, track data on your impact of your program, so that you can share that results back to your, um, your funders or your donors. How can you use technology to communicate with clients? Um, I've heard some really good examples of how some youth-based nonprofits are really embracing social media because they realized, well, they might like telephoning people, but there are no teenagers these days that prefer telephoning to Facebook or Twitter or SMS or other methods of communication. Uh, so how can nonprofits really think more about what their clients want and, uh, and get in that space? Of course, if your clients, uh, you know, maybe if your clients are older, that's not their preferred method of communication. So there's no blanket statements here. And lastly, of course, how can technology be used to communicate back with your partners and stakeholders? So maybe if you're running a joint program with other organizations, you're using some common file sharing areas, you're collaborating on documents together, um, maybe you're sharing uh, in real time back some of your, uh, your data and your fundraising or your, your program results so people can see and stay in the loop with that instead of having to email files back and forth. There's a lot of different ways that technology can touch your programming. So because I can't talk about everything, I'll share one cool example that we've heard about recently that we're really excited about because I think it speaks to that kind of way of rethinking uh, how you think about technology and putting that upfront investment in technology that is uh, leading to better programming and then leading to greater impact. So the case study we're going to talk about here is an organization based here in Toronto called the Furniture Bank. And essentially what they do is uh, people who are getting rid of their furniture businesses or individuals will give their furniture to the furniture bank. And then if you have uh, people who are maybe uh, getting their first house after they've been transitioning away from homelessness, if you have women and children that were in an abusive situation and now are starting their new life together, um, or you have refugees or newcomers to Canada that need that little help to get started and get established, one of the basic things you need is, of course, furniture just to you know, have something in your home. So they give this furniture that they get donated to uh, any one of these types of clients free of charge. Now how this works in practice, or what used to work for them in their manual way of doing things, is they would have a client come into their location, tell them what their needs are, and they would fill out a whole bunch of paperwork. You can imagine them standing there with a clipboard, going through all of the information, writing it all down. It took about 16 minutes. Uh, while they were doing that, of course, the cli other clients coming in would have to stand there waiting. Then after that, they would have to go back and enter all of that data into their systems. So basically do the same piece of work twice. And then go through manually, figure out, okay, what furniture do we have? Who is that going to go to? Do all that matching up and follow up. So they did a little calculation. They found all of that manual work uh, equated to about a loss of 50 working weeks per year. So some of you guys were asking before about buy-in. Whenever you can actually uh, calculate some of the impact of uh, the manual processes, do some time estimates and make a calculation like this to present something to management and say, 50 working weeks, that's how much we're losing here. That's often a really compelling way of uh, articulating the impact that technology can have if we invest in technology to improve the process. And so that's exactly what they did in, uh, in this situation. So their solution that they chose is a combination of using Salesforce as a Salesforce as a CRM. If you guys aren't familiar with it, it is cloud-based. They implemented CRM for their organization, and they also got a bunch of iPads. So the iPads can run the CRM or the Salesforce mobile app. So instead, when a client came in, the, uh, the intake person had their iPad, which connected directly to Salesforce. So they were able to fill out the information right on the iPad. 
So this was already a lot faster and it decreased the client time to five minutes. So it's a lot better experience for the client, not to mention that, that uh, the staff person doesn't have to do the double amount of work of going back and doing all that data entry later. So that saved them on both ends. And because of all this time saving, they were now able to serve an additional 500 clients per year. So again, seeing how this changing the technology foundation was able to improve their programs and services and ultimately uh, make a difference to the mission uh, up there at the top of the house. So um, to wrap up, the last section I'm going to talk about is aligning technology with your strategies. And this is where it does get a little bit more abstract and a little bit more up to that leadership and board level. But as you mature as an organization that's using technology, this is really the key piece uh, to maintain a good technology uh, plan and attitude going forward. So I've come up with three key questions that I would get you to ask yourself about your organization. And of course, ask, and then if the answer is a quick no, um, how can you work on that? So first of all, does your strategic goals have accompanying technological goals? So if, you're, if you have a strategic plan, hopefully, go through it and say, you know, see what the areas are. Maybe you're planning to expand a program next year. Maybe you're planning to launch a new program. Ask yourself, well, what technology is going to be required in order to make that happen? Uh, maybe we're going to add a whole bunch of new people. That's going to strain our network. Maybe we need to buy new computers. That's an infrastructure problem. Maybe we need a better database to manage that, so a data challenge. Maybe uh, we need to put in place uh, some custom software, you know, if you really have the resources to run this new program. So thinking, linking technology goals back to strategic goals is another way to show the value that that technology is playing rather than it just being a cost center. Next, are your leadership and board supportive of technology? And this can be a really tricky one for a lot of nonprofits. So I, I, of course, there's no easy answers I can tell you about how to get leadership and board buy-in if this is a challenge for you. But I will say um, some of the things that we've seen worked are A, being able to really quantify the amount of time that technology could save. Uh, and another thing is to get those small wins. So when you can do a little experiment, get a few of your coworkers on board who are a little bit more supportive, sometimes that can help better demonstrate the value that technology can provide. And lastly, do you have a technology budget? We do recommend for every nonprofit to at least have a line item consistently in the budget for technology. And that can really help make sure that technology is a discussion that is always on the table. Now I realize I just have one minute to wrap up, so I'm just going to quickly share this case study of an organization who is using, making fantastic use of technology and is incredibly strategic about how they do so. And this is an organization called Time Razor. Again, it's a Canadian charity. I won't go into the details of what they do, but you can find more about them on their website. What's really interesting about Time Razor is their commitment not only to technology planning but to openness. So you can actually find out all of the details of their technology budget published online that is updated in real time. And this they make really easy to do because of the tech tools they use. And th their approach has really been, if you look at some of their technology budget line items, you might think that seems a lot, especially for an organization that has just a handful of staff on it. Now the flip way of thinking about it is that because they make these investments in technology, which aren't too big, but for some of you, depending on where you're used to, may feel a bit large, because they do that, they can only need to have a few staff and they can run a ton of programming all across the country. So again, um, making that investment can really help increase your impact. So they're a neat one to check out. We'll just leave you with a few more resources. So again, especially when you're trying to find that right tool or uh, you know, find the right way to save on costs, a few really good resources are the donations program. There's a lot of great open source software out there. There's a lot of good, your peers will have really good suggestions. So you know, on Twitter, using the MP Tech hashtag, using the communities uh, of N10 to uh, get ideas. And of course, other nonprofits like the TechSoups of the world and like Ideal where that provide well-researched, thought-out recommendations on technology specifically for nonprofits. So um, that is our framework that we're hoping to leave you with, and we do want to have a few minutes to ask questions. So I'm going to stop talking and uh, hand it back to Becky now. Thank you, Tierney, and thank you, Joyce. What a breadth of information that you've shared. You know, we did a webinar last week um, 
with some people who uh, you know have expertise in grant writing. And one of the things they always get questions about, how do we get people to fund the infrastructure? How do we get people to fund and help pay for the technology? And this is one of the big challenges. And you know what their answer was very succinctly was that when you're writing grant proposals, when you're seeking funding, that you need to build in the technology budget into your programs. That in order for you to deliver on that program, you need to have maybe two laptops upgraded. Or maybe you need to have um, you know, a donor management system to better help manage a program that you're delivering on. So keep that in mind because I know that it's a really difficult challenge to, to build out that budget that was listed um, you know, on, that, on that page that you just showed showed um, that it's hard to get the funding and the buy-in from leadership. And you know, that is actually one of the first questions that was asked. How do you get your leadership to support this? If maybe your leadership isn't super tech friendly or tech savvy or doesn't see the value in it, um, you know, how do you encourage that buy-in? And maybe this is a good question for Tierney since you're still on the line with us. Well, you know, only the hardest question uh, to share, but uh, no, just joking. Yeah, I responded um, that it's the million-dollar question. Exactly. <laughs> We'd all love to know how to how to make that happen. Um, so yeah, I mean, I will say some of the things that I shared earlier in terms of being able to quantify the uh, the, the value that um, like the amount of time saved with um, technology solutions. Um, so an example of it can often be a good way. So just one example of that, a little more concretely. I have a friend that works for an organization that does uh, basically supports youth through high school, and uh, his he was he's really super keen about technology. One of these accidental techies that really wants to create change, but he was struggling to get that leadership buy-in. There wasn't really a lot of interest in talking about that, so he kind of went off and did his own thing a little bit. I mean, I don't totally recommend going <laughs> completely off the radar, but he said, you know what, I'm going to take this situation into my own hands, and I'm going to think about how I can do something that will get people's attention. And so this actually references another comment I mentioned. Uh, what he did is he found they were calling their youth to uh, let them know if there was a, a change in the time of a program or any other information they needed to provide to the, their clients who are youth, they would give them a phone call. And that would create a lot of uh, time wasted because just being on the phone, um, you know, like listening to the voicemail, often the youth wouldn't be there trying to leave a message with their sibling, with a parent that probably wouldn't be getting through to them. It was a really inefficient way of doing that. So he actually calculated how much time that was taking. And then he basically proposed that they, uh, he started actually contacting the youth in his portfolio on social media. So he created a separate Facebook account for himself. In this case, this was back when more youth were on Facebook. Now they do more on Twitter. Um, but he created that account, uh, and again, keeping in mind good social media policies, and uh, was using that to contact youth instead. And he found basically the calculation he did was it saved the equivalent of two full-time staff per year just by not making these phone calls and using Facebook instead. So when he brought that stat to his executive director, all of a sudden they were really interested. So just one idea that may or may not work for you, but hopefully that will be an inspiring story. Um, but those kind of things, uh, if your leader is willing to um, you know, get some, uh, do a little training and education, that can be really helpful too. Um, I'm personally hoping to see more and more things, more and more training opportunities for leadership that do, they do have technology bundled into it. Um, and also helping to raise those questions early. Um, sometimes you know, change does take time, so getting them to come around to that technology lens does take time, but it is a key competency in today's nonprofit leadership world. So um, I certainly Absolutely. hope that uh, you can help play a role in getting your leaders there. I know it's not easy. Absolutely. I, I would say that that's very true. And you know, one thing that some of the apps and, and tools that were mentioned by both Tierney and Joyce today are free. And so we know free, there's always a cost to any new tool that you implement, whether it's in staff time or labor. Um, but you know, sometimes proving to a leadership uh, or someone in a leadership position that, hey, there's value in this, happens just by diving in and doing it. Um, you know, where maybe you don't need to put money down to try out a new tool, even in a small way, and say, hey, look at the impact of this small thing. If we put some money toward this other thing, maybe it would be even bigger or better and um, you know, get the license to dedicate some more staff time to it. We are at the top of the hour, and we've actually answered pretty much all of the questions in the chat already. Um, and I will go ahead and follow up with all of the links that we shared out in the chat in this follow-up email. But just to show a couple of other resources, 
We have um, some business and tech planning sections on TechSoup.org where you can continue to learn more. Uh, we have Tech Planning and Policies Community Forum where if you are looking to try and develop technology usage policies or those types of uh, you know, personnel type things in your organization, there are some great conversations happening in there. We also have a webinar that we did earlier this year that talked about tactical technology planning. And we have this guide for disaster planning and recovery that it is uh, kind of couched in how to prepare for disasters. But so many disasters that, that come upon us are not earthquakes or tornadoes. So many of them are, oh my gosh, the server died. Oh my gosh, that employee left and nobody knows how to get into this important critical mission uh, data that we need. So that's a great guide that has a lot of interesting worksheets to help you uh, prepare and plan your technology as well. And then we also have um, Idealware offers an online training series in tech planning, and they have a discounted offer on our site that we'll go ahead and share in the follow-up. I'd also like to invite you to join us for our upcoming webinars. Next week we'll be doing one on telecommuting and tactic tip, tactics, tips, and tools to help you whether you work remotely one day a week or full-time, or whether you have staff distributed all over the country. We'll be talking about how to manage and what kind of tools are available. Then we'll be talking about why Internet freedom matters for nonprofits and libraries, and how you can fight to keep it on February 12th. We'll be doing some in-depth library work on the 18th around inclusive information access and assistive technologies and how they are being used in libraries to help provide access to all patrons. And on the 19th we'll be talking about tech donations for faith-based organizations. You can also explore our webinar archives for the huge range of webinars we've done in the past as well. And feel free to connect with us on TechSoup at TechSoupGlobal.org, TechSoup.org, or on our Facebook or Twitter channels. Lastly, thank you so much to both Tierney and Joyce for taking the time today to join us and sharing their expertise. Thank you to Allie for helping on the back end. And thank you to ReadyTalk for sponsoring this webinar by pro providing the free use of their platform where you are using their ReadyTalk 500 tool today, which you can also get in TechSoup's donation catalog. When you close out of this window, please take a moment to complete the post-event survey that will pop up so that we can continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you have a terrific day. Bye-bye.